can't go that low with the whistle. Ah. All right, you guys, we are starting in three, two. This is Twiss. This Week in Science, episode number 626, recorded on Wednesday, July 5th, 2017. Wait for it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we are going to fill your heads with pretty boys, little runaways, and magic. No, science, lots of science, but first. <laughs> Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The future is gone for now. It'll be back later. After you choose your nows, and choose your nows carefully, they're going to add up. Now, these nows that flow freely will be either end as a resource or as a debt. You can live a dream. We all do it, but is it your dream? Are you even in it? Throw yourself into it. Be resilient in your actions. They make the fabric of your tapestry. These actions of yours become you. As intentions thread together reality, you become you. And while you set out on a path, while you set the pace, while you set your mind to have a mindset, we will attempt to dial you into a world beyond intention. A world despite you, but not in spite of. You have already arrived at a destination, one within your head, but not limited to the skull walls that surround. You have entered... This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. Science to you, Kiki and Blair. And good science to you, too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to yet another episode of This Week in Science. Every week, a new episode, but always more amazing science. Every week, more discoveries. It's pretty amazing. Hey, happy 4th, 5th of July, Happy 5th America. of July, everybody. Happy 5th of July, too. <laughs> happy 5th of July, everyone. Happy every day of July. <laughs> happy. <laughs> Yeah, I hope everyone in America had a wonderful, or not America, America, America is two continents actually, but the United in States. The United States. In the United I States. I hope States people had a wonderful there. 4th of July. Also, yeah. I, yeah, I hope other people did as well. It's a great day to have a barbecue no matter where you're from. That's true. Great, great day. All right, let's just keep moving. All right, on this week's show. Lots of science news. I have new stories about old concrete. I have runaway stars and a reason to avoid eating placenta. <laughs> I, I'm not sure we needed more, but I can't wait to hear it. I got a new one. All right, Justin, what did you bring? I've got some new Neanderthal news, uh, some potato origins, and menstruation brain. You have menstruation brain? This is going to be such an interesting show. I'm oh confused. <laughs> okay, Blair in the animal corner, what's coming up? Oh, I have a whole bunch of nightmare juice today. I have birds that eat insects, insects that eat birds, and a robot milker. Hmm. Wow. Okay. All right. I didn't want to sleep tonight anyway, so let's just get right into it. All this science and more coming up in the next hour or so or so being the operable parameter there. And we're gonna dive right in with our first segment of the show. This weekend, what has science done for me lately? This is the new segment of the show where I would like to read what science has done for you, really, you out there, our listeners, our viewers. What, it, what does science do for you every day? What has it done for you lately? You need to email me and let you know, let me know so I can read it on the show. This message came from Minion Conrad Rahil. He says, what science has done for me is to help me live my life to the fullest. I have a hard time controlling my mood and focus and have for my whole life. 
working with several doctors to get cognitive behavioral therapy and the right antidepressant and stimulant medications for my condition have helped me get through my day and be uh, to help me get through my day a lot more smoothly without science and the scientific community i might not be here today thank you for making the show and good science to you all good science to you too conrad thank you so much for writing in with your story so many things that science does for each one of us many unique wonderful stories. And remember, we need you to write me so that I can let everyone in our audience know what science has done for you. And we can all go, oh, me, me too. Yeah, we can compare our stories and understand the impact of science in our world. You can leave us a message on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash This Week in Science. Or you can email me until I get my This Week in Science email fixed. I don't know what's going on. I thought it would be fixed, and it's still not. But anyway, you can email me at kikifinch at gmail.com. And I do want to fill this segment of the show out with something from our Minion community every week. So help us and write with your stories. Please. Please, let's keep it going. All right, diving right in. <laughs> How about a good case for not eating placenta? Again, not sure it's necessary, but give me what you got. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> well, no, this is, this. there is, there is, there is, I don't know if it's anecdotal, I don't know how scientific it is, or how, how wivesy tale it is, but it's, it's said that it has benefits right. by some. Right. It is said that it has benefits by some, and so people ingest it, they save it after birth, they save the afterbirth, ingest it so that it can maybe you confer those benefits onto them so however how it really there's not much scientific evidence backing these benefits at this point in time but the cdc has posted on one specific way that people ingest the placenta and a particular case study that they have published in the agency's morbidity and mortality weekly report some individuals dry the placenta and then grind it up and put it into pills. So it's not really cooked at a high temperature, but it's dried like an apricot and then ground up into placenta powder, put in little yeah. gel caps and then those gel caps can be ingested over whatever time period it takes you to ingest them all. So about two months. Okay. About two months. <laughs> So this particular case study that was reported, healthy baby born to a healthy mother. The mother uh, had uh, hired a company to make placenta pills for her. And uh, but this, that's just not really the story yet. Shortly after the birth, the baby started having signs of respiratory distress, went to the neonatal intensive care unit, and had a life-threatening blood infection called group, late onset group B streptococcus agalactiae bacteremia, otherwise known as GBS. And usually there's antibiotics that can cure it. And so after 11 days of antibiotics in the hospital, then the baby got to go home healthy and safe. Five days later, baby's back in the hospital, sick again, again, the GBS infection. Wow. And so the doctors then were like, okay, what do you have going on at home? What is happening? And this is when they find out that she is taking these placenta pills. The researchers said, okay, hand them over. Give us the pills. And they tested the, the powder in the pills. And they were not only filled with placenta, but also GBS, the bacteria that was causing the infection. Yeah. And so the mother was eating the pills and then the bacteria was ending up in her milk, which the baby was ingesting. And then that made the baby sick. So GBS is very common and it's usually not an issue, but it's, uh, at least for adults, but in newborns who are still depending on the mother for their uh, immune system, because they don't, newborns until about six months don't really, or at least for the first couple of months, don't have much of an immune system to talk about. So uh, it just had passed right along and the baby didn't really have factors to fight it off. And 
Uh, and so these levels of GBS may be also increased within the mother's bloodstream and into the milk, and then we're able to transfer to the baby. So you really should, if you're going to eat placenta pills, make sure that it's cooked and that it comes from a company that's not packing them with bacteria as well. So uh, forgive me if I'm wrong here, but the placenta is basically waste storage during pregnancy, right? Not waste no. storage. I mean, this is where the blood of the mother and the baby intermix and intermingle. That, that is the, the placenta is right. the organ for passing things back and forth. Right. So it provides oxygen. Okay, I was looking it up. So it provides oxygen and nutrients, but it also removes, it helps remove carbon dioxide and it removes waste. Yes, it removes so, it. So, so it's not, it doesn't store it. It, it doesn't takes, store it. No, it, 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 it takes it away and then the mother's body filters it. Okay. But yeah. so in that process, some, some bad stuff can end up hanging out in there. That's, that could happen as well. Yeah, there could be some waste products that are in there as well also. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking because if it's, if it's part of the filtration system in a growing fetus in, you know, you were just saying they don't have developed immune systems yet, then that kind of makes sense that that would be the thing that some of these bacteria would be hanging out in. <laughs> No, the question here, though, is not that it came from the placenta, the bacteria came from the placenta, that it was the processing, actually, of this, uh, oh. of this company that may, I mean, we don't know whether the, um, the GBS actually, uh, we don't know whether it was concentrated in the placenta before mm. it was packaged into the, in the pills, or whether it was part of the processing mm. Like that there's some kind of contamination that took place. The um, the placenta was de it was dehydrated, so it was never cooked, and so there was never any processing that would kill bacteria. I see. And so just improper it, food handling is what it, was, I, it yeah. seems like. It's kind of improper food handling. So maybe the story here is don't just not eat placenta, but if you do, make sure it's really well cooked first. Right, because just like we were talking about a few weeks ago one would categorize it as cannibalism, which means it is considered a meat product. And we all know you cook your meat well. Mm -hmm. Or if you dehydrate it, like in jerky, then it's very well salted. Right. There you go. <laughs> Placenta jerky. Whoa. <laughs> that made it worse. Sorry about that, you guys. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Um, Moving away from placentas, let's talk about extinctions. Boo. We know there, yeah, boo. We know there have been Yay. no extinctions well, no, we, on We needed planet. a couple, otherwise we probably wouldn't be here. Just yeah, be there's good ones and bad ones, for sure. <laughs> right, there's a recent story that suggests that the majority of the frogs that are on the planet right now would not be around if, there, if it weren't for the massive... Uh, massive meteor that came through and killed off the dinosaurs a few frogs stuck around and maybe that yeah. led to maybe that led to the expansion and proliferation of the frog species on the planet today but what mm -hmm. about all those crazy big marine animals what happened to the megalodon what happened to giant giant sea turtles what happened to these crazy giant marine mammals they all moved to a lock in scotland yeah, no, they didn't, unfortunately. Um, according to a new study that's described in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, there is a, a new extinction that nobody really knew about until now. It's now described in this article. Uh, shark, megalodon, and other giant big marine species went extinct around 2.6 million years ago. We lost about a third of all large marine species at that point in time. So there were many more large things in the oceans and something happened 2.6 million years ago that, uh, that caused a massive distinction. And so what they figured out, they did a meta-analysis looking at a bunch of other studies 
looking at the fossil record of sharks, marine mammals, birds, turtles, other things marine related. And so they were able to actually characterize the extinction. And they have uh, a lot of the works that are in the paleobiology database that is public and anybody can search. But they found as many as 43% of sea turtle species, 35% of seabirds, 9% of sharks died out at this time. But there were at that point in time really massive sea level fluctuations. And so coastal habitats were under huge fluctuations also. Habitats were, uh, were devastated and reduced as a result. So if you've got the ocean kind of going up and down along the coast and it's happening too quickly for the populations of, or the ecosystem to be able to keep up with, then the, the whole, that's going to cause a trophic cascade where all the species that rely on the smaller species, the producer species that are along the, the coastal um, habitats, they'll all end up moving, uh, end up dying out. And so what they think is that this trophic cascade led to these marine mammals like sea cows that megalodon feasted on declining. And so then there were also uh, new competitors and everything was just kind of changing and it was just too much of a fluctuation for species like megalodon to be able to continue to exist. Hmm. Yeah. But I heard megalodon's still here. I, I don't, well maybe Shark Week's coming up so maybe we'll talk, maybe we'll find Stop out. Stop bashing that. Shark Week. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's Shark just Week say, is awesome. Shark when, Week should be more and of a celebration. Informative sharks and the, yes, the knowledge yes. that we have of them and celebrating ecosystem conservation that will help protect sharks in their natural habitat. Megalodons are extinct. We're all going on the record right here. Yeah, no, meg megalodons are extinct. Or are they? Tune in to Shark Week to find yeah. out. Let's, let's just be concerned about the species that we do know yes. are here and alive and maybe Please. hopefully keeping them alive in this time of serious climatic fluctuation. There we go. That's what we want to do. Yeah, so um, at this particular time, two to three million years ago, uh, some, some animals won out. And so it's thought based on their analysis that groups like that uh, the polar bear's Ursus was a big winner, it was able to survive at that point of time. The storm petrel, Oceanodroma, and the penguin, Megadiptes, these, uh, these adapted and evolved after this extinction period. So habitats opened up that allowed them, niches opened up that allowed them to survive. Okay, even while, yeah, they were saying Megalodon wasn't gonna eat them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's an interesting um, question about, you know, functional diversity in ecosystems, characteristics and behaviors of organisms, and then how that can affect, how that plays into the whole ecosystem and how it all works together. Yeah. So not just those large dinosaurs were subject to extinction millions of years ago. Yeah. Also other big marine things. And then my final story, which has nothing to do with extinction, but just looking up at the sky. Researchers look up at the sky and they've over the years seen about 20 of a particular kind of star that's called a hypervelocity star. And it's a big blue star that's moving really fast through the Milky Way galaxy. Going really fast, and they're like, "What is that star doing?" And the researchers hypothesized originally that they had interacted maybe with the supergalactic center of our galaxy, the black hole there, Sagittarius A, and maybe pew, they got shot out away from the center of our galaxy. But then this group, they're like, "Hmm, let's take a look at here." And Douglas Boubert, a PhD student at Cambridge's Institute of Astronomy and lead author on this paper, says earlier explanations for the origin of hypervelocity stars did not satisfy me. 
The hypervelocity stars are mostly found in the Leo and Sextans constellations, and we wondered why that is the case. How could they have gotten there? So these researchers from the University of Cambridge looked at data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and computer simulations, and they were able to actually demonstrate that these stars pretty much, they originated in binary, in binary orbital concentrations, so two stars, they used to orbit with another star, in the large Magellanic Cloud, which is moving very quickly in orbit around the Milky Way. And these stars, their partner, supernova and shot them off, but not only just shot them off in their own galaxy, shot them out of the galaxy. And so it's kind of like they were running on a train and then jumped out at the velocity of the train. So they had like, or, or maybe they were on a train and somebody, I don't, maybe somebody pushed them off the train. That's what it is. Somebody pushed them off the train. So rude. I know, velocity of the push and then the velocity of the train, it all combines with where the, uh, the large Magellanic cloud is in the sky. And this clustering of these 20 or so hypervelocity stars around these constellations. And so the, all of their uh, calculations and computations suggest that this is something that might be happening, that there might be a lot more of them and not just hypervelocity stars, but maybe, um, maybe lots of other galactic, uh, lots of other celestial bodies that have been ejected from their place of origin and that we might look at them in this way to find more of them. They predict that there are about 10,000 runaways spread across the sky, even though they've only seen about 20 of them right now. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Runaway, hypervelocity stars. And so we just have to look, look for them and we'll probably find them. Uh, Buber says the European Space Agency's Gaia satellite will report data on billions of stars next year and there should be a trail of hypervelocity stars across the sky between Leo and Sextans constellations in the north and the large Magellanic cloud in the south. So now they're just gonna look for the trail of stars that were pushed off the speeding Magellanic cloud train. Which is pretty awesome. Pretty fun stuff. Yeah, quickly moving stars. There's an explanation for everything if we look closely enough. We'll soon find out if they're right about this. More data. This is This Week in Science. Yeah. Got, Justin. Speaking of more data, if you've listened to the show for any length of time, you've likely gotten a better idea than most uh, of, about our Neanderthal cousins, how like us they were, and how whilst we once thought it was very unlikely that we had interbred with them, uh, you now know that it's occurred multiple times, perhaps much more often than we still now even believe. Now a new study is illustrating uh, that it happened a lot earlier. Oh. Much earlier, incredibly earlier than we may have predicted. Like how much? What do you mean by incredibly? Well, so the current view is, uh, what is it, like, 50-ish thousand years ago, maybe a little bit further back, sort of that during that period of the, the out of Africa migration. Settlements around the Middle East, yada, yada. We have that one outlier though, right, from the Neanderthal and Siberia that showed pretty much modern human ancestry. But that was like 200,000 years old or something. It was much, much older. We have that one outlier. Now, they did a mitochondria uh, study, DNA study, on a femur from a Neanderthal in, in Europe that is showing, interestingly, uh, it's showing some human markers, even though it's, 
well, it's pretty old. So the study published today in Nature Communications based on this signature is placing the date of the event of humans entering the Neanderthals mitochondrial DNA stream between 220,000 years ago all the way back to maybe 470,000 years. It's a really big window. Yeah. Really big window. But the, the low end is 220,000 years. Right? That is well before the big out of Africa migration. You know, we consider that to be at around the 100,000 year-ish mark, right? So what's interesting, though, is this Neanderthal has nuclear DNA that's almost entirely in common with Denis uh, Denisovan, right? The other hominin roaming around Siberia and, and parts of Europe. So, but their mitochondria, much more similar than to now to a modern human which suggests this Neanderthal had mothers that were human. But a really long time before there's supposed to be any mothers in Europe. Because uh, uh, mitochondria, that's the one that goes mother to mother, or mother to child. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's passed down through mothers. So that ends at a son, right? It, sons can't pass it on. Only mothers pass this on. And the mitochondrial DNA is a little bit different DNA. It's a lot different DNA. It's different DNA than your nuclear DNA, than the rest of your DNA. That makes you up. It's identifiably different. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty fascinating. Uh, Neanderthal and Denisovan, pretty similar with the nuclear DNA. Then all of a sudden, between 470, 220,000 years ago, mitochondrial DNA of Neanderthals is no longer similar to the mitochondrial DNA of a Denisovan, even though nuclear DNA is the same. So prior research analyzing nuclear DNA from Neanderthals, the split uh, from Neanderthals to modern humans, this is our, our regular genetics split, was estimated at approximately 765 to 550,000 years ago when we sort of split from them. However, studies uh, looking at just the mitochondrial DNA showed that split to be about 400,000 years ago. So there was this problem. How can we have split off with them more than 500,000 years ago if the mitochondrial DNA is only 400,000 years split? Like that was like a problem that they were trying to fix. Okay. And so this, this may be, the, the, the answer may be some humans uh, much earlier than predicted left Africa and started intermingling with Neanderthals who had already left hundreds of thousands of years before, or maybe a hundred thousand years, some period before. So that's yeah, pretty wild. Uh, whenever we start to think that we've got it, this sort of, the, the, it sort of mixes up again. So there's been a debate about the cause of that. It's been proposed. One proposal is that uh, there was that earlier uh, hominid migration. There's a, see, there's another, this human group more closely related to modern humans and Neanderthals could have introduced their mitochondrial DNA to the Neanderthal population in Europe through genetic admixture as well as contributing a small amount of nuclear DNA to Neanderthals, but not to the Nisovans as we at least have not found that. Uh, but there needs to be a little bit more on that. So yeah, this is yeah, it's pretty interesting. We we are that the whole out of Africa history thing is going is going through more and more. Um, we're, we're finding more and more clues out there that humans are just wandering. We just we got bipedal and we started walking in directions, and we got really good at that, and we just kept doing it. We're like this is fun. We always love to go jogging. When you see those joggers out there in the morning, don't make fun of them, as I often do. Don't make fun of them for getting up really early to go for a run. People have been doing that for all of time, for as long as I think we can say that we were people. That's yeah, the want the wanderlust has is maybe a part of our a part of our DNA, possibly that whole. I mean, I, I imagine that you know there's and there's something there's something about who we are. We've followed the animals. We follow the food. We've probably we started in one place and then had to move from there to be able to survive. It's also interesting. I guess this is uh, 
They're also saying that the uh, Neanderthals, other Neanderthals that they've discovered don't necessarily have this uh, modern humanish mitochondrial DNA and that the Neanderthal that they tested here would probably have had to separate from other Neanderthals that they've tested by as much as 220,000 years, right? Because they don't, right? Because if it's back in its lineage 220,000 years and there's other Neanderthals that don't have it, they haven't been the same population for 200 so it's something that right. also also it's suggesting that wandering humans were wandering yeah and it's suggesting they say here that neanderthal population size was much bigger than estimated uh for the final stages of their existence and going back so there may have been much larger neanderthal populations than we sort of uh, imagine currently hmm yeah i just have an image of these small groups of individuals, whether Neanderthal or human, that there were small, very small tribal groups that you couldn't have them be too big. But they traveled together and then, you know, oh, they ran into some other group of people or Neanderthals. And yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was a weaving in and out and in and out and in and out. It wasn't yeah. one time that these two groups, hey, got together. Yeah, <laughs> and then I mean, multiple, in, right. multiple meetings, multiple yeah. and, times. Yeah. And I think the terminology for this that's being used now for, for not just the Neanderthal human experience, but for all of modern hominin, or for all of hominin history is a braided stream. Yep. Uh, where it, that's great. it mm -hmm. keeps sort of flowing back into different uh, aspects and deviations of itself. This, we are this great experiment, these humans. Here we are. But enough about humans. <laughs> enough you know about time humans? It is? I know what time it is. Do you know what time it is? It's time for Blair's Animal Corner. Yes. Yeah. She loves our creature, cried at all. Buy a pet, mill a pet, no pet at all. About animals, she's your girl, except for giant pandas and squirrels that are both girls. What you got, Blair? I have some really exciting news about some interesting animals. To start, I wanted to talk about fairy wrens. Kiki, are you familiar with fairy wrens? Yes, the yes. fabulous fairy wrens. They're wonderful. Fabulous. They are fabulous yeah. because normally they're kind of brown and, and cream colored. But in the mating season, the males turn bright blue. Mm, <laughs> and, yes. And so uh, it, they live in Australia and Tasmania. And researchers have been interested for some time in many factors relating to fairy wren dimorphism for a few reasons. The first one being that not all male fa fairy wrens turn blue. And that the same fairy wren does not always turn blue every year. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Now yes. that's fabulous. So Even knowing fabulous. that, it makes all of their population dynamics and their adaptations related to this color change more complicated and more interesting. In particular, researchers from Monash University and Australian National University wanted to look at whether the brightly colored fairy wrens attracted predators more and if they knew it. And so what they did um, is they were able to study these guys and play warning calls to them and see how they behaved. And they found that the males acted more cautious when they were blue during their blue period <laughs> compared to the behavior when they remained brown. So they were able to test brown individuals versus blue individuals, and they were able to test the same individuals in a blue period versus not. And so, so they were so so during their uh, it, while they're impersonating Picasso, they're exactly yes when they're painting lots of sad clouds. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So th this was a perfect opportunity 
to test beyond individual behavior to not just say this is a this is an easily spooked fairy wren versus this is a confident fairy wren no they were actually testing behavior dependent on their color which is a pretty unique opportunity and they found yes that they were more cautious when they were blue they also tended to be more sensitive to low risk calls and responded faster to high risk calls. So across the board, they were more sensitive to warning calls when they were blue. They were more likely to abandon activities they were engaged in when they heard a warning call. They also found, this is very interesting, that other fairy wrens in the vicinity, the non-blue ones, were less careful when around a blue fairy wren. So that's either because they felt that the predator would go for the bluebird or <laughs> they were counting on the bluebird to act as sentries and respond quickly. So this, this is quite complicated. Let me unpack this real quick. So first of all, yeah. these birds know when they're blue. Unequivocally from this, we can tell because they change their behavior unless it is the side effect of some hormone that's controlling the, the, the color change. That's what I would guess. That's possible, but most likely they recognize that they are susceptible. So they know when they're blue or their, their behavior is different when they're blue. But beyond they, that, they know when to hold them. They know when to show them. Yes. They know when to walk away. They know when to run. So, right. so it's interesting. Well, the whole thing is interesting. But yeah, something that I find interesting is that color, color changes and coat changes uh -huh. that happen uh, when, a, when an, an organism is in development, when it's before it's born. Uh, coloring pa coloration patterns can be tied to the mother's hormone level of either being at ease or being stressed that can change the outcome of a coat of like well in a classic instance of foxes right but would that but with that in but would that uh, affect it seasonally because what she said so, is yeah, that the this, same this individual is what, right yeah. this is what's fascinating this is what i'm really curious about now because i hadn't really applied that to something that just does that seasonal coat change or yeah. like or color change uh if there's if there's hormones that are that are in there and being active mm -hmm. based on based on their current level of stress right. or comfort, or if it creates a level of stress or comfort right. in them. But right? yeah, also that within a population of these birds, some of them will choose to turn and some of them won't. So yeah. what is causing that? Is it because they, they made plenty of offspring last year, they're taking this season off because it is more stressful to turn blue, right? So that's kind of the secondary question here is, if they recognize that turning color makes them more susceptible to predators and makes them exert more energy in getting away and abandoning efforts and all these sorts of things. Is that why they don't always turn blue? Is that why they essentially opt out of the color change, even though that is the desired trait when a female is picking a male? I feel like it's it's more like going through puberty like again and again, but then sometimes not. Like, <laughs> like no control. Right. But what is signaling well, oh, no. what is signaling those those hormones or what is signaling that that color change? I don't know, but you can tell it's gonna happen starting with the pimples. Well, there's also there's also the question <laughs> of in some uh in, in many species in springtime, it is food availability. And so you have species like crossbills who they eat certain berries that have uh, that have pigments in them that then are conferred into their feather into their feathers, and so they get orange and reddish coloration as a result of the food that they eat. So maybe mm -hmm. some birds are finding food and others aren't. Is it a nutritional thing? Yeah, we don't know. Mm. We don't know Somebody what is up with the fairy out. wrens, but what we do know so far is that they know when they're blue. They do know, so it's like they have they an know, awareness. They know, as Tobias yeah. would say, they know when they blew themselves. <laughs> they would, they do. Yes, and moving on to <laughs> the animals that then would eat said birds. Let's talk about like 
bird cats cats that eat birds yeah um, lizards, lizards even bird eating tarantulas no frogs no no praying mantises what that has to be a very no. large praying mantis praying or a very mantises. tiny bird so a study oh. by zoologists from switzerland and the u.s mm. show that praying mantises all over the world include birds in their diet so we already know praying mantises are carnivorous but what, what we're used to seeing them eat are arthropods insects spiders other praying mantises occasionally they've been witnessed eating small vertebrates like frogs or lizards or salamanders or snakes not something but, that flies through the air with the greatest right. of ease so a new study from martin niffler from university of Basil, Mike Maxwell from National University, La Jolla, California, and James Van Remsen from Louisiana State University have shown together praying mantises eat, kill and eat small birds on every continent except for Antarctica. Well, because they're not on an Antarctica. Right. So they Antarctica. found they found praying mantises from 12 species and nine genera. They showed them eating small birds. They were documented in 13 different countries on all continents except for Antarctica. And they ate birds from 24 different species and 14 families. So this is a widespread, this is a normal thing for praying mantises. They found 147 documented cases of the feeding behavior from their short study. More than 70% of those, though, reported in the United States. And the most common birds, Hummingbirds. Okay, I can yeah. see well, that. Now makes small. a little bit more sense. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, and so the the plants pollinated by hummingbirds, the the praying mantises would hang out in those plants and then grab them. <laughs> uh, but so the reason this is so interesting and so important is that remember I said on every continent, right? And that most of them were in the United States. Well, it turns out a few decades ago, we released a couple species of mantises onto North America as biological pest control. Hey, good you'll, job, everybody. You'll know how I feel about this. Yeah, oops. Introducing species intentionally generally doesn't work out great. So... They found that both of these large mantids, hey, guess what? Eating birds. So these imported species are now a huge threat to hummingbirds and other small birds in the United States. You know what? You know what I, I bet is a, a much bigger threat? What? That, that, that has been introduced uh, into the ecology across the United States. Mm -hmm. Cats. Come well, on. there's that. It's cats. Cats are much worse. If you want to be opposed to an animal that shouldn't be where it is, it's the cat. Okay, that's totally not what we're talking about, though. We talk I'm about cats. Throw... We talk about cats we talk all about the cats. time on the show. Okay. I think our listeners are well aware that cats are a threat, but this is a new threat this that we have reflecting. not examined. Reflecting. That we didn't know yeah. was a threat. That Praying now mantises. That we unwittingly released yes. all over the place. Okay. Yes. Okay. So my point being, yes, cats, they're pets. They end up places where they shouldn't be. They kill native birds. Yes, we know all about it. People put jingly necklaces on them. Sometimes that helps. So we should get rid of the cats. Yes. Moving on. However, Ed, 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 however, Ed, okay, okay, go ahead. These these mantises were brought for an ecological purpose. And now we're finding out that they eat birds so even an animal that we think we understand fully we understand the the impact it's going to have on a new environment when we introduce it turns out guess what praying mantises pull birds out of the sky and eat them this is an unintended consequence we've discovered decades later that is actually though that's that's pretty impressive that's pretty yeah. awesome for like, all for for all the times that I've released, that you have how many how many of you have you ever gotten one of those little mantis egg pods and put it in the garden to watch the praying mantises? 
No, but I've I had gardens raise, full of those things. I raised a praying man, uh, a group of praying mantises in kindergarten, though. Yeah. So I mean, mm-hmm. we've all we've all released, uh, not we've all, but many of us have yeah. released praying mantises into the environment. Um, you know, it's and they're not exactly the same as ladybugs, now are they? No. Which are also yes. fierce carnivores, by the way. Predators, right? Yeah. Aphids, I kill you. Yeah, but this is this is yes. this is interesting. I mean, ladybugs aren't going around after birds, right? You know, right. Large but, but endangered look, frogs. I'm, I'm still, I'm still gonna just. I have to say though, the le- level at which I think they're probably pre- uh, taking down birds. <laughs> I mean, come on, like it's it's can't be that that big a number. Oh, it can't be Justin. that large of predation. So it just can't be. That is a such few birds a crappy down. attitude. <laughs> like really? No. Compared to cats, it's just a drop in the compared, bucket. No one cares. That's such a bad drop attitude. In the bucket next to cat. That's. Yeah, I mean, I don't even think the birds know what's happening. That's like <laughs> throwing a can on the floor and going, "It's just one can. It's not like I'm dumping my whole trash can no, on no, the I'm floor." I'm just saying. What? What? Like, what bad I, thing could I've come seen of it? Birds visibly nervous when they see a cat. I haven't seen a bird like, oh, there's a oh, you know praying why? mantis. Run you know the other why? way. Because they never look see the mantis coming. The mantis just goes, huh, and it's dead. That's and this is why, oh, no, Ed from Connecticut, we are not going to GMO the mat- mantises to attack cats in gardens. <laughs> yes. That's not yes. going to happen because you know what's going to happen? Then it's going to be that crazy Japanese praying mantis sci-fi movie right. where the mantis is then giant and eating people. That's just, it doesn't stop with cats. That's anyway, great. bottom line, cats are bad. No, Justin, the bottom don't line. Don't the, hijack my bottom line. Are you kidding me? We said what, what the bottom, bottom line, line is. I'm the sorry. bottom line is that this is, uh, we're using biological control Wait. to you control can't just other take animals. Bottom line. Why, why are you taking Blair? It was Blair's bottom line. Now you've completely stolen it. Oh, no, boy. I'm repeating her bottom line. You don't have to woman explain it for her. She can do it perfectly well. It's, I'm so happy your shins are out of kicking range right now. Um, yes, yeah, so as Kiki was trying to say, and I was trying to say, everyone but Justin was trying to say, <laughs> intentionally introducing biological pest control is always problematic. Even when it works out, there are problems that arise that were not expected. Sometimes they don't eat the thing you want them to eat. Sometimes it turns out they eat endangered birds. We don't know. If we if we don't know every little thing about a species before we re- release it into a new space, it is not a great call to do that. Yeah. And mantises are the perfect example. Around the world, they've been eating birds, and we haven't known. Now we do. Because they don't leave them on your doorstep. So, so maybe you'll we'll think twice thing, about though. that awesome mantis, that awesome mantis egg sac in my garden. But is it is yeah. it is it to the point like like if the alternative is like what is their 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 other diet consisting of? What benefits are we actually getting in the long run? Like maybe it is even with this more beneficial. Now, well, but not, remember, I, Justin, hummingbird analysis I'm, 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 is what, always a good idea. Hummingbirds yes. are pollinators. I get the bottom line. You understand why pollinators are important, right? I, I'm getting the bottom line of yours. You, you shouldn't generically introduce a thing that you don't know everything about into an environment because th- bad things can happen. But I don't think we should say that the praying mantis isn't a net positive yet. Because that's not what the study is saying. This study is not saying that. This is true. But it's also it is saying that remember, there is a negative. It it what a else do praying benefit. mantises eat? Praying mantises eat spiders. Do we want to reduce the number of spiders in our world? We do not because they eat pest animals as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to take this show to the break because... It's really just time for a break. This is This we Week in Science. Also get rid of chocolate factories, because I understand a lot of chocolate factories kill spiders. Isn't that a thing? How many spider legs are in we chocolate? We should get rid of people who sleep with their mouths open then. Yeah, those are the ones killing all the spiders. 
<laughs> this is this week in science. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back after this with more science, maybe less of this kind of debate. All right, you guys. I hope you stay tuned and join us. Kiss, stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> heard with more than intuition the line of reason shows the way to go no conclusion the methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to, or if you're watching right now, for watching Twists. We do appreciate you being a part of the show and for enjoying us week after week. We do try to bring you the best show we can every week, and with your help, we're able to do that. So if you would be so kind to head over to twist.org, I'm going to tell you about a few ways that you can help out Twists. You can be a producer, right, on the back end, helping us financially, an executive producer, I guess, helping us financially keep this show going. Over at twist.org, we have an easy way to help us out, which is to click on our donate button. There's a nice little donate button. Takes you right to a PayPal interface that allows you to easily donate one time and I hope you enjoy doing that if you enjoy the show. Also, you can click on the Patreon button that's on the page. It's a tab at the top of the page. It'll take you to our Patreon page, which is also at patreon.com slash This Week in Science. And then you can just click on the button that says Become a Patron. And as you're a patron, you can choose your level of support and how often you want to support us, what you, what you do. We have many tiers of support, and there's a whole community over there, over on Patreon. So maybe take a moment and check that out and see if you want to help us out over on Patreon. If you are not into that kind of financial support, or maybe you're just looking for a shirt to wear, or a new mouse pad, or, you know, a tote bag. We all need a nice tote bag. Head over through the Zazzle tab on our twist.org page. Click on that Zazzle link. It'll take you to our Zazzle store, which is at zazzle.com slash thisweekinscience. And you'll be able to peruse our items, which are lots of twist logo items and many items that are covered with beautiful art that has been created by Blair Vizdarich over the last couple of years for our Blair's Animal Corner This Week in Science calendar. So take a look at those. There are many pages of products, many types of products. I'm sure you will find something that you will enjoy though there. And right now it looks like that there is a, there's some kind of a discount deal going on. If you go, they have a code, SUMMERSAVE50. You can type that in and get a discount on many of the items. So maybe if you like, you like discounts, you like, you buy. We would like it too because it, the proceeds do go to help This Week in Science pay the bills and make things happen here. If, however, you are the type of person who's like, meh, give me something else to do, I would love it if you would tell your friends about Twist. So if you headed out and told your friends, check out twist.org. Go to twist.org. Or, oh, I found this awesome channel on YouTube, This Week in Science tell them about that. Or, oh, have you seen the This Week in Science Facebook page? It's just facebook.com slash This Week in Science. Super easy. They've always got neat stories all through the week. They've got posts that link back to their show and the stories they present every evening in the show. So much fun science. If I didn't listen or watch, listen to or watch Twist, I wouldn't know half the things that I do. Or Twist blows my mind at least once a week. Tell your friends this. Tell your coworkers this. Tell the people in your social media groups, <laughs> all these things. Tell them maybe to subscribe on iTunes. There are all sorts of ways that you can help us grow and help us continue to bring you This Week in Science week after week after week.
We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do this without you. I can't believe you believe in that shell. We disagree, but I still give a damn. The ramification of treatments from holy men Leaves me slightly queasy deep down in the abdomen Convinced that the lives that they lead need adjusting They drive to the bookstore and blindly start trusting And we're back with more This Week in Science. Yeah, Justin, it's your turn. What you got? It is. I don't really know. So this is... Uh... <laughs> This is uh, researchers of National History Museum of Utah, Red Butte Garden at the University of Utah, have discovered potato starch in crevices of 10,900-year-old stone tools in Escalante, Utah. This is, uh, this is possibly their earliest sign of potato being used as food, like anywhere. Like, there's, there's some evidence. Uh, in South America, that may be about that old-ish, but I think this one outdates it by almost a 1,000 years. Uh, this is the first archaeological study to identify a spud-bearing species native to the southwestern United States. This is Solanum gemesi is the name of this type of potato. And it looks like it was an important part of the diet of Native Americans at 11,000-ish years ago. They... They have a hard time with potato history. Uh, potatoes don't preserve too well. Like we're we're pretty good at figuring out when corn was first used because the corn husks preserve pretty decently. We can tell what kind of animals uh, people were eating because they leave the bones around, right? So we know chickens and turkey history of eating them. We know corn history of being used as food, but potato kind of just doesn't leave a very good record. It just kind of disintegrates and is gone. Uh, but they did a, a pretty interesting, had a pretty interesting, uh, they, they found the starches in these, uh, in these stone tool and martyr, mortar things where they would pound them out and, and mash them down. Uh, in a place where I guess researchers had looked at stuff before, but they weren't looking for starches. So then applied the right right process to discovering it. Uh, they, they piece together evidence from stone tools, ethnographic literature, and modern gardeners that show Utahns have used this species intermittently over the last 10,000 years. And it was, it was, this is, well, this is one clue. Escalante area of Utah had previously been known as Potato Valley to the <laughs> early settlers. Okay, there's a sign right there. You should be looking for potato history. Yum. And the region. Uh, it says here several Native American tribes, including Apache, Hopi, Kawake, uh, Navajo, Southern Paiute, Tiwa, Zia, and Zuni consumed the Jamesi potato. Groups used various cooking and processing techniques, including boiling potatoes, grinding them into flour yeast, and mixing the potatoes with clay to reduce bitterness. Some groups still tend potatoes of this population in cultivated gardens today. Wow. So, the bitterness is a big thing, though, because isn't the bitterness? I mean, of the potatoes, it, a lot of them were toxic, and so th that they found one particular type that was maybe a common potato that was used. It probably got shared between between those groups of people because um, you didn't want to eat a potato that was going to kill you. Yeah, yeah, that's, it took a little trial and error. <laughs> that, <laughs> hopefully that took place really quickly. I kind of sort of imagine like the early days around the campfire of humanity finding something new. It was sort of like a science experiment without like, you know, pre-human trial. <laughs> you gather around the, the fire and somebody... All right, I'm going to try it. Found this new thing. <laughs> and then they'd eat it. Everybody just sort of sit around and watch them. If they made it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, somebody else tries it. And then somebody else, somebody else. Eventually, when nobody dying eating this thing, you know, that would, at least that's how I'd do it if I was an early uh, paleo person. So uh, it, one of the fantastic things is this sort of unlocks a big piece of the diet that was missing. This is a high-energy food. 
uh, that if we didn't know that people were eating 10,000 years ago, uh, it sort of flushes out their diet from what we knew that, that was there so far, adds a whole lot of calories to it. Uh, so, and this is not your, this is not the potato that we are eating now. We eat a completely different variety. Uh, everything, every potato you could think of, the red ones, the gold ones, the russets, the thousands of potato types that mm. are commonly found in grocery stores all derive from sol solanum tuberosum, which is, uh, was des domesticated in South American Andes 7,000 years ago. It's the one that in the 1500s was sent back to Europe and became the European potato as well. So this is the lost potato history. Uh, really, really kind of fascinating. So another, another thing, another thing Native Americans did, had that we just didn't know about. Potatoes, they, they're getting a lot of news lately. There's actually like a potato research center that's working on, I think we, we talked about a while back about finding a species of potatoes that could could possibly grow on Mars. And they're, they're working on ways to be able to test this by sending potatoes to space to grow. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, so right. we if, have if a you, long history with the potato. If you've ever been to this, and this is maybe a good candidate too. I mean, if you've ever looked, if you've ever been to the, the Southern Utah area, that Four Corners, New Mexico, I think Arizona and Colorado get involved. There's like it's very much states. like Mars. No, I'm kidding. It's very, <laughs> it's very dry. Now it may not have Shots always fired. been, you know, 10,000 years of, of weather study, uh, may have been a bit wetter. The Anastasi people that disappeared probably had a decent water supply up until a point. Uh, but this might be a, this might be a potato that, you know, could do better on a place like Mars. Probably not as but, good when French fried, though. We don't know. Maybe don't not. Know. We don't know this. And uh, actually, the, they're looking at they're looking at the like the that. Department of the United States Department of Agriculture is going through the DNA of this potato, looking for genes resistant to drought and disease, exactly. so that they can help strengthen the current potato and the, grow it on Mars, Tuberosum, and make it a little bit more hardy and grow it on Mars and grow, and grow it on Mars. <laughs> Oh, no, but have we have we actually sometimes you can't improve on things. Sometimes you have to go back in time to just find out how things were done originally. Mm -hmm. Got to go back to the original, like the original concrete. <gasps> Did you know that the Romans created concrete that has withstood thousands of years of erosion by the sea, by the wind? It's still standing. And we have these concrete things that it's like, eh, it just takes yeah. a little while and they just start eroding. And I mean, concrete's strong, but it doesn't, it, yeah. it's really not going to last thousands of years. Uh, can I make a guess here? They what? used, uh, they used uh, iron nanofibers and uh, uh, in, in, in then they magnetically aligned them. No. And just oh wait no that's what we're trying to no. do now yeah no no they, they 3D printed it no uh, but they yeah, they, they were the everything they were the dudes that came up with the the idea for arches right so they definitely uh, well, they they had some ideas but they made concrete yeah. by originally by mixing volcanic ash they took volcanic ash with lime and seawater to make a mortar and then they put volcanic rock in that and that was the aggregate that the mortar held together and so it was kind of like this ash water and quicklime that had a reaction that's called the pozzolanic reaction it's named for the city of pozzuoli in the bay of naples and what they think is that the romans originally got the idea for their cement by looking at these volcanic these naturally cemented volcanic ash deposits called tuff that are they're common in the area and pliny the elder even described them in his oh, writing elder. i've yes, heard of him great, you, you've just had the beer blair <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 pliny was a good observationalist and very wise uh, but a researcher 
from the U University of Utah, geologist M Marie Jackson has been studying the minerals and the micro scale of the concrete structures of, uh, of Roman time. Um, and she's been looking at it as she would any other rock, a volcanic rock, whatever. But she has published, and with her colleagues in American Mineralogist, an article that explains what has made Roman concrete so, what allows it to last? how it has lasted through the eons and through basically what they found is that in contrast to modern cement, specifically modern Portland cement that's used, which is the strongest cement we have, uses rock aggregate, but the sand and gravel particles are inert. They're not supposed to interact with anything. And so the idea is that the cement is formed and you don't want it to expand at all and you because it, expansion could crack the concrete which would make it less strong in the ways that you want it to be but this roman concrete however they found that there was a act, an actual mineral that intergrows between the aggregate and the mortar as a result of chemical reactions with the seawater. And this mineral is formed in lime, these forms in the lime particles through this pozzolanic reaction. And usually it forms, it can form in elevated temperatures, but in the presence of seawater, it didn't have to be elevated temperatures. The seawater actually got this pozzolanic reaction to happen at a lower temperature. And so an aluminum tobermorite mineral is what is found. And she says that this is a very difficult mineral to make. And synthesizing it in the laboratory requires high temperatures and you only get really small quantities. But this very uh, specific reaction over long periods of time and extended interaction with the seawater allowed this mineral to just grow over time. And so over time, the concrete has actually grown to be stronger. So it's a dynamic concrete as opposed to an inert concrete like the concrete that we create. And so the recipe that the, Rus the, the Russians, the recipe the Romans used, mm -hmm. it probably wouldn't be good for building um, high rise apartments or bridges or other structures um, that maybe have steel interspersed with them for structural integrity, but maybe they could be great for doing, uh, for creating seawalls. Maybe this recipe could be really useful uh, in very particular situations. Hmm. So Roman concrete, she says, we're looking at a system that's contractor contrary to everything one would not want in cement-based con concrete. We're looking at a system that thrives in open chemical exchange with seawater. And this, uh, this recipe over time was actually, it's just completely lost to history. And this study, her study, she's done um, work with the University of California, Berkeley to do uh, very high resolution imaging of the minerals to be able to identify them. Um, and she's studied ancient texts. She's studied the concrete very closely. And um, just through time, working with a geological and working with a geological engineer, they're trying to develop a replacement recipe and hoping that uh, it might be something they could, that could go into use at some point in the future. Nice. Yeah. So the recipe, we'll have to figure it out ourselves. I think it's, you know, maybe the Romans looked at the tufts and came across it by observations and happenstance. Uh, but we're having to use many modern technologies to be able to figure it out. And we still, we're not quite sure yet. So it's taking us a long time to find Fast this course. this lost recipe. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Jackson, I love this this quote. The Romans were, uh, she intends to continue the work of Pliny and other Roman scholars who worked assiduously to discover the secrets of their concrete. The Romans were concerned with this, Jackson says. If we're going to build in the sea, 
we should be concerned with it too. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, Del Poco, that's interesting. I had no idea. I'm going to have to read up more on Pliny. Died sailing a little boat to save a friend during the Vesuvius Pompeii thing. Huh. Yes. Pliny the Elder. Pretty sure he got saved by Doctor Who in that episode. <laughs> Maybe one, one episode. Yeah. And then went, later on, went on to play Doctor Who. This is all. I could be wrong. No, tell me. Uh, I think you might be wrong. Maybe you've got a uh, menstruation brain or something. Yeah. Are you kidding? Yeah, okay. So this is what my, my teaser was. What am I talking about when I refer to that time of the month? Menses, Mother Nature's Gift, the curse, the period, the rhino, menorrhea. Rhino. Yeah, rhino? A... Never, I've never heard that before. Okay. Well, cool. It might be a local Davis thing, but it's referred to around here as the, the rhino. Uh, <laughs> All right. News. New study uh, published in Frontiers of Behavioral Neuroscience, uh, setting out to change the way that we think about the menstrual cycle. It's often been assumed that anyone who's menstruating, which I would assume any woman who's menstruating, isn't working at top-notch mental pitch. Professor Bridget Leners and her team of researchers have found, maybe not surprisingly, there is no evidence to yeah. suggest that there is a deficit in mental cognitive abilities during that mother nature curse time of the yeah, yeah. month. I don't know if I this, need to go into more than that, but they did, uh, they did actually, yeah. there have been other uh, studies that said, well, yeah, women behave a little bit like this or they're a little bit like that. Uh, but they point out that those were really, really small sample size studies Hers is uh, considered the largest, which even though it's only 68 people, it's still the largest uh, sample size that they've done on this. And they did not one cycle, but they also did a second cycle of those same individuals. Uh, and so they have a better, better, a little bit better uh, overall look at uh, if there's a constant difference or if this was just when you happen to be talking to them, they were at a little bit of a deficit or didn't apply themselves well, well or what their differences were over time that sort of thing i wonder if i definitely think there's a missed um allocation between being emotional and not being as cognitively aware and those two things are not really same. related mm -mm. at all just because a person might have mood swings that does not make them more or less smart in that moment or more or less aware of their own mood swings, which is a whole nother element of that, right? And yeah, I would say I this sounds correct. And this sounds correct in that people might make that, uh, that kind of ill-advised conclusion that because there are other things going on with that individual that their mental proclivities are reduced. But pain, Hormones, emotion, those things don't necessarily reduce mental ability. Oh, wait, maybe I've read this wrong. So it says here the results from the from the test suggested that cognitive bias and attention were affected. And in attention. The first, in the first cycle. Uh, but these results then weren't replicated in the second cycle. Hmm. Yeah, Which so means they only nothing. It means nothing. We only followed Which individuals two, two cycles. cycles. Yeah. Yeah. Sample size could be larger. Sample Again, size is small. Largest there, of its type. It is Which the butt. It seems there like could also all they be issues to related to food. Women. There could be issues related to sleep. There could yeah. be issues related to so many other things. They just didn't find a correlation between hormone levels and these particular measures over Two measures. Two measures. Over two the two measures. measures. Like, so it says here, like, while some while like, some hormones were associated with changes across one cycle and some of the women taking part, these effects didn't repeat in the following cycle. Overall, none of the hormones the team studied had any replicable, uh, uh, replicable okay, I can't say replicable, cons yep. uh, consistent effect mm -hmm. on study participants' cognition. Working memory was fine. Cognitive bias, ability to pay attention was fine. Everything was fine. Uh, yeah. There you go. So, 
So think, get off my back. <laughs> I think it, I think it, uh, I mean, I think what it suggests is that they saw something and then they didn't and that they need more, either more individuals or they need to follow those individuals over lo longer time periods. Um, because it doesn't, I mean, it seems like a very small overall sample Again, size. Largest of its type. And so this, Just the best evidence then. Well, it means, I guess, I, I would say it means the best study that we have of its kind did not At show. At this point in time, did not show. Yeah. Right. Good enough. So, <laughs> uh, to avoid, I will say nothing more because I just don't want Blair to shout at me anymore. So, I'm just going to be quiet. <laughs> hey, those sh that the, shouting is regardless of other variables. For the variables. rest of this show. Yeah, so I'd, I'd show love to... Passes. It's, it's interesting. So they're looking at very specific tests. I'd love, I, I, I haven't looked into this study, so I'd lo love to lo know more about specific tests that they, that they did. I mean, they assessed visuospatial working memory. So can you remember, can you rotate objects in space? Can you remember where things are located? Can you walk through a house blindfolded? Um, attention, are you able to pay attention to things during these periods of time, or does your attention wander? Fine. Cognitive bias. I want to know um, what that means exactly, what the yeah. tests are. I, I couldn't walk through my own house blindfolded. It, <laughs> it also seems like, I, I, I think it's definitely, the men sees are definitely like the, the big item with a target on its back for uh, looking at hormone swings and looking at, at effects on people. Mm -hmm. But the opposite end of the month, is a similarly hormonally tumultuous time, and there's and, and there's and, a, and there's a drop in those swings also during tumultuous. ovulation. There yeah. is a significant drop in estrogen as well. Right, um, that's, there, that's, what that's what I'm referring to. There are multiple peaks and valleys over the course yeah. of the month, but I mean, you know, they they followed those peaks and valleys, and this is the pro of it. They didn't do like individual times of measurement i guess i'm i'm guessing i have to look i have to look at what they did when when did they take these hormone okay a series of eight measurements of hormonal parameters scheduled at predefined days of the cycle days 4 7 9 or 10 12 13 17 21 and 28 so a pretty good spread over the uh, over the cycle for each woman for two cycles I think I think they need more data. I also I have an overarching question and I don't want to get into the realm of non-science because we are a science show, but I think it is important when you're looking at research to think about the implications, the funders, the people doing the research and the motivations behind the research, right? And for me, when I hear this research, and, and I could be totally wrong, which is why I should read all of this stuff and I should find out what the motivation for the research is. So here it is right here. But at first, uh, professor, hold professor on, let me finish, let me finish oh, what I'm going to say. Oh, okay. It's just that okay. to, at first glance, and please prove me wrong, it sounds like ju trying to find justification for saying that women's mental proclivities fluctuate. Yeah. So it was Professor Bridget Lehner's uh, she's a specialist in reproductive medicine and a psychotherapist. She says, I deal with many women who have the impression that the menstrual cycle influences their well-being and cognitive performance. So wondering, wondering if this is anecdotal evidence, could be this anecdotal evidence could be scientifically proven and questioning the methodology of many existing studies on the subject. Her team set out to shed light on the topic. Okay, so it sounds like it was actually the opposite side, and they're hoping to empower individuals to no, feel no. like they have abilities. No, I think she looked into time. whether or not there was, I don't think she went in to say it was to go, otherwise you're dismissing her as being biased going in. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think she heard it a lot and went, I wonder if there's an actual thing okay. you can point to and say this right. is why. I and, and, I think that and now you will find, stop I, taking, tearing I, apart the study because you, you prefer the direction it was headed in. Thank you for your bias. We'll go on to the next one. Okay. I, just, <laughs> I think it's hard to say that any study is gone into without any expectation whatsoever of what will happen. 
they even say they need to do more research at the at the end of this. They didn't use a properly nice. counterbalanced design, and they need to. Uh, they have they have some issues acknowledging their limitations. There you go. Their sam firstly, though our sample was considerably larger than those commonly assessed in this field, a sample size of over a hundred would be preferable due to the substantial variance in hormone levels at given time points. Secondly, though, to the best of our knowledge, we were the first to use data from a second cycle as external validation criterion. That sample consisted of a subset of women for the first cycle. Therefore, this data from the second cycle was not independent from data from the first cycle. In future research, it would be worthwhile to assess an independent validation sample. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, we assessed only three cognitive functions. That is visuospatial working memory, divided attention, and cognitive bias, which are certainly not exhaustive, and hence do not cover the whole range of cognitive fun functioning. So additional tests would be preferable. Fourthly, 30 women presented with endocrino endocrinological disorders, and therefore their hormone oh. levels may deviate from healthy controls. There um, we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and let's see. And then finally, fifthly, we did not incorporate a counterbalance design. So more tests, more tests, more tests. Mm. There were, and it's it's great to see that this. I think I think this is a good this. They're investigating, and this is yeah. what we need to do. I mean, seriously, I'd love to know. I mean, I know how I feel. I know maybe how other women I've spoken with feel at different times of the month. But it would be great to know if we can turn this from anecdote into science. Yeah. That's hopefully, what hopefully science will one day find a cure. <laughs> <sighs> Moving on for menstruation, let's talk about some killer pregnancies. I mean, pregnancy in killer whales, mm. that is. Huh? Yeah, a multi-year survey from 2007 to 2014 looking at the endangered population of southern resident killer whales suggests that up to two-thirds of the pregnancies failed in that population during that time period. And the survey, the study published in PLOS One, pretty much pins this population uh, pregnancy trouble on what they think is a low abundance of salmon. They say that's the primary factor for low reproductive scent success among southern resident killer whales. During years of low salmon abundance, we see hormonal signals that nutritional stress is setting in and more pregnancies fail. And this trend has become increasingly common in recent years. These resident killer whales typically feed from May to October in the Salish Sea, which is uh, just north of Seattle off the coast. And they go out to the open Pacific Ocean in the winter time. Uh, they're not really considered a transient population. They don't feed on marine mammals. Uh, most of their diet is salmon with Chinook salmon making up three quarters of their diet. And, uh, and they can actually follow what's going on and the orca scat, they can gather orca scat. They can get basically orca poop to be able to determine what is in the orca's diet which is what they did. Um, they used also orca DNA extracted from the scat to determine sex of the individual, their family pod, and the individual that was responsible because they have other DNA um, samples from these individuals because they've been monitor monitoring this population for so long. Um, it's really interesting to actually get the orca scat. They had to train dogs to sniff out this floating the floating feces from the bow yep. of research boats so they had dogs on the prows of boats research boats that were going out and trailing the pods of orcas and these dogs were so great at sniffing out scat they could detect it a nautical mile away they were able to get 348 scat samples from 79 orcas over the time period of this study um and uh, basically overall hormone levels and all sorts of other things that they measured. There were all sorts of signals that just these, these uh, whales were under nutritional duress. And so there were higher likelihoods of failed pregnancies. Mm -hmm. Poor nutrition. 
poor nutrition. Because, you know, they need that omega-3 fatty acid from the fish oil, right? <laughs> that and a lot more. But this, uh, they, they really think that this is the major force that is reducing or uh, limiting population growth in the southern resident killer whale whales, which is already an endangered population. Uh, just so the listener knows, I, I am currently looking up what orca poop looks like. And it looks exactly like what you would expect. <laughs> so, okay, now we all have there. to Google it to try to find out what that means. That's what everyone gets Here, to I'll Google. Here, I'll do a quick and, share for everyone. And while you are all Googling orca scat, I have another fun, this is a fun whale story to move out of the kind of sad, scary story of our overfishing and our uh, the changing climate and the changing abundance of salmon in the uh, Pacific Ocean and the Pacific Northwest coastal region. Humpback whales, they're another great species of whale that's out there. They are large whales and they blow bubbles. And according to uh, a, a new study looking at bubbles being blown by humpback whales, we're finding that uh, they use them for a variety of reasons. So they think that humpback whales don't just breathe out these bubbles. They, uh, it's been established that the bubbles are used to corral krill and fish when they're hunting. Uh, they think it's an important form of communication. They also think that it could be used to convey emotion in that communication, kind of like an exclamation point or a superlative or maybe a, a gesture. It could be a sign of distress. It could also be used as a toy for play or even sexual pleasure, according to uh, this researcher named Reidenberg. Um, there are many, uh, this researcher and a, a colleague also uh, say that they have seen bubbles used for non feeding purposes, not only out of the whale's blowholes. So there's a possible tactile or sensual experience to the bubbles as well. Mm -hmm. So humpback whales, possibly using bubbles for more than you thought, which is kind of cool. But something I didn't know, there's a study um, by this group from 2007 that they found that, this, uh, that when humpbacks blow bubbles through their blowhole, they actually have a risk of drowning. So this is... Yeah. Letting up the air. I guess that's yeah. Sense. Yeah. So bubbles important and fun for humpback whales. Hmm. Yeah. Any more stories there? Um, I have a fun story about milking a milking robot. So we already have uh what are basically robots that give us our cow milk, right? Right. It's all automated now. But what about scorpion milking? <laughs> huh? Why would you want to milk I mean, a scorpion? Great how, question. How many scorpions would you have to milk before you'd have like enough for cereal? Mm, and delicious. Can we, that, can we turn that into a tongue twister? Delicious. Now, uh, milking a scorpion is not for any lactose-based product. It is for the scorpion venom, and it's used in medical applications like immunosuppressants, anti-malarial drugs, and cancer research. But the way that they historically get scorpions oh. and dangerous. So the options are electrical stimulation by hand so that's attaching some sort of stimulator to the scorpion with your bare hands or mechanical stimulation which means basically encouraging the scorpion to strike something and then kind of squeezing the venom out or puncturing the venom gland or doing an abdominal removal, which essentially kills the scorpion. 
A new robot that is out of Ben Masik Hassan II University in Morocco actually recovers venom fast, safe, and remotely controlled. The VES-4 device is lightweight, it's portable, and uh, they can use it in the lab or in the field. In fact, it can even be, it can store via its memory um, different for different species. So you can kind of pre-program that. And it has an LED screen that allows users to display the name of the species they're currently milking. And this robot, you you kind of, you remote control it. It clamps onto the tail and electrically stimulates the animal, just like the first version that I was talking about, except no hands are involved. It expresses the droplets of venom. It's captured safely. It's stored. And nobody has to touch it. <sighs> so this VES-4 can be used by one person via remote control, safely recovers scorpion venom, remotely oh that word is used again so this is this is really this is great this is something that we could potentially use to get snake venom in the future this is this is definitely moving in the right direction so we don't have to wrangle dangerous animals to venom harvest harvesting things from them automated venom the animals harvesting. Either. yeah <sighs> absolutely oh, scorpion I don't know. milker Robot. Peta's gonna love that one. Peta, Peta, they're Peta, they're gonna yeah. love that. Automated venom harvesting. Mwah. A scorpion. It's perfect. Unless you like it's scorpion. plus, you know, can cancer research. And it doesn't hurt the scorpion. The scorpion can they can just collect one in the field, use this thing remotely, let it go again. It's off on its merry way. Hmm. All right, I like it. Without its necessary venom. Uh, right. No, it'll it'll make just more. make more. That's fine. Right. Don't worry. They'll they only need more. a couple drops of it for their research, so cool. it's not bad. Hey, Justin, one of your favorite studies is the marshmallow study, right? Uh, oh, yeah, the uh, reward uh, uh, delay study. Yeah. So historically, this was like in the 1960s originally, a psychologist ran an experiment trying to look into self-control in children and they took young children ages three to five and they were given a treat and then they have this instruction you can eat the treat now but if you can wait until i get back because i have to go do something right now if you can wait until i get back and not eat it you'll get two treats so can you hold off eating that amazing treat? Sugar sticky, right there in front of you, treat hedonistic pleasure, or can you delay your grat gratification for later? Oh, I didn't realize that was gonna be a thing. I already ate the marshmallow. That's right, you already did it. Anyway, most, the reality is over. most kids cannot delay gratification. They're gonna gobble it, gobble it up super fast. My, um, my three kids actually have done this to them many times. Uh, they do anyway. very well on this test. They All right, so okay. until it doubles and I do a double again and I do a double again and then, then they're bouncing off the walls and I have to stop. <laughs> well, they're probably gonna have great SAT scores according to this research. Re this research shows that kids who can delay gratification um, do better in life later on. They have higher score higher on test. So now this is the new twist on this study. Researchers um, have now tested children outside Western culture. They've uh, taken four-year-olds from an ethnic group called the Nso the in Cameroon in Africa to uh, test how they perform on the marshmallow test. And they compared their performance against a group of German children. What they found is that the Cameroonian kids, according to the lead researcher, Bettina Lamb, Cameroonian kids really behave very differently. They were able to wait much better. And when mm -hmm. you ask how much is much better, nearly 70% of the Cameroonian kids compared to about 30% of the German kids could wait a full 10 minutes to get a second marshmallow, 10 minutes long. 
And in, in their article in Child Development, they even report that about 10% of the children, while they were waiting, like, they even fell asleep while they were waiting. Uh -huh. The kids, kids from Cameroon, it was as if they were meditating. They just were calm. They sat there and they waited and there was no distress among the children. Um, compared to the German kids, they're trying anything to distract themselves. They're like playing with their toes, uh -huh. doing anything, sitting on their hands, trying to find ways to stop themselves. So they're trying to figure out now, what is the difference between, is, the, is it the child rearing techniques, the parenting techniques of the Cameroonian parents in this group of Nassos or versus uh, more westernized parenting techniques? And um, they say that the, the mothers actually do things very differently within this group of individuals. The moms breastfeed their babies before they start to cry so they don't ever need to express any negative emotions. This emotion is al already regulated before it's expressed. Um, and they teach the kids, they, she says, the kids are expected to learn to control their needs and not ask for their desires or wishes. So there's horrible, horrible much different people. learning, much different so, learning, but the so there kids is, there's that, but there's, okay. So, so the, this has also been shown that, uh, typically they was used back in the fifties to show that white children had more patience than children of minority sex. Right. And, and, and there've been updates to this study where they realize that part of your su survival strategy, hmm. if you are poor, is to take that reward uh, that reward now because you've learned through your own experience that things can change quickly that yeah. it might not be there and if you don't take advantage of that impulse to get that reward now you often fail to get it right especially yeah, if you go to a, a dinner table with with seven other hungry irish children <laughs> and there's there's food enough for five if you don't hurry up and get your you know potatoes on the plate if you don't start eating right away <laughs> the reward won't be there <clears throat> yeah so, so so that's what the researcher so, the researcher also <clears throat> goes into this and she says uh what also matters is the kids expectations about whether waiting will be worth it or not and she says we have evidence that kids take under consideration the statistical nature of what has happened in the past so for example if a child is living in an environment where there's lots of uncertainty and instability then they may think that waiting isn't likely to pay off even though they have the ability to delay gratification and so what she suggests is maybe uh the cameroonian parenting technique boosts the trust that the kids have in the adults so that they trust the situation and they trust that that person is going to bring the second treat when they say they will and that the the situation these children came from was it gave them the security to be able to sit and wait but is that a good thing <laughs> i don't know sure. much yeah, patience yeah. <laughs> um, so moving on from that, a couple of really quick final stories. Uh, the bloop, you guys, we've talked about the bloop sound in the oceans. There's this sound that people have, it's like a conspiracy theory on the internet about the bloop. It's this strange sound. It's heard on hydrophones across the Pacific. It was heard in 1997 and uh, it's this loud, ultra low frequency sound and it was uh, discovered at listening stations underwater thousands of kilometers apart and so uh researchers have been trying to figure out what caused it and one idea is that it might be an animal of some kind that has some interesting vocal sound production technique um but national oceanic oceanic and atmospheric administration has been doing some tests and they have reported that it's not an animal it's actually the sound of the cracking of an ice shelf as it breaks up from Antarctica. Yeah. Uh, one of the researchers from NOAA and who's an Oregon State University seismologist, Robert Dziak, he says that one of the issues that people have had in talking about this is that when it's played back, the way people play it back is usually at about 16 times the normal speed. And so it, then it wow. does sound like an animal vocalization. Right. And so when you actually play it at the actual speed the sound occurs, it 
fits quite nicely with other recordings of cracking ice that Noah has picked up under the water. So not a strange animal. It's cracking ice. It's cracking up, man. And then finally, NASA's Juno spacecraft. It just celebrated a year in orbit yesterday around Jupiter. And next week on the 10th, or this week in between now and next week, um, it will do a, another close flyby of Jupiter and it's going to focus specifically on Jupiter's great red spot. All of its instruments will be turned at that massive storm that we can see on the surface of Jupiter. And so hopefully within a couple of months after next week, we'll get some really interesting data back. And maybe even within a couple of, of weeks, we'll have some neat reports from NASA about what's going on there. I can't wait. Juno's giving us some really cool data because Jupiter's awesome, big and awesome. <sighs> and does that do it? For our big and awesome show. That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's it for this week in science, you guys. Thanks for a good show. That was fun. And thanks everybody for watching. Thank you for listening. Thanks for being a part of the show again and again and again. And I would like to take a special moment to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thunder Beaver, Paul Disney, G. Burton Lattimore, John Ratnaswamy, Richard Onimus, Byron Lee, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Jacqueline Boyster, Tyrone Fong, Andy Grow, Keith Corsell, Jake Jones, Chris Clark, Richard, Charlene Henry, Brian Hedrick, John Grinley, Steve Holt, Stephen Bickell, Kevin Railsback, Gerald Sorrells, Ulysses Adkins, Dave Friedel, James Randall, Bob Cardelder, Calder, Mark Mazaros, Ed Dyer, Trainer84, Layla, Marshall Clark, Larry Garcia, Randy Mazuka, Tony Steele, Jared Onyago, Dave Steve DeBell, Kyle Washington, Greg Guthman, Time Jumper 319, XB, Daryl Lambert, Harun Sarang, Alex Wilson, Jason Schneiderman, Dave Neighbor, Jason Dozier, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, Jason Roberts, Richard Porter, Rodney, David Wiley, Robert Aston, Sir Frankadelic, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Paul Stanton, David, Brendan Minish, Dale Bryant, Aurora Lee, Todd Northcutt, Arlene Moss, Bill Kersey, Bren Rothig, Darwin Hannon, Rudy Garcia, Felix Alvarez, Brian Hone, Orly Radio, Brian Condren, Mark, Nathan Greco, Hexator, Mitch Neves, Flying Out, John Crocker, Christopher Dreyer, RTM, Shuwada, Dave Wilkinson, Steve Mashinsky, Rick Ramos, Gary Swinsburg, Phil Nano, Braxton Howard, Saul Good, Sam, Matt Hutt, Sutter, Emma Grenier, Philip Shane, James Dobson, Kurt Larson, Stefan Insom, a Honey Moss, Mountain Sloth, Jim Defoe, Jason Olds, James Paul West, Alec Doty, Illumin Lama, Joe Wheeler, Dougal Campbell, Craig Porter, Adam Mishkon, Aaron Luth, and Marjorie, David Simbley, Tyler Harrison, and Columbo Ahmed. Thank you for all your support on Patreon. Thank you to all of those who are new to the list, and thank you to those of you who have been on the list for a very long time. You all help us out so much. And if you are interested out there right now about supporting us, you can find information at Patreon dot com slash this week in science and remember that you can help us out simply by telling your friends about twists and on next week's show we will be speaking with dr jens foil he's an f he's an fmri researcher who we're gonna maybe talk about some cool things like phantom limbs and other brainy topics we're looking very much looking forward to that and we'll be back for that, as usual, broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday. Twist.org slash live is where you can watch it and join our chat room. But don't worry if you can't make it. You can find past episodes at this week in uh, YouTube. No, where? Twist.org <laughs> slash <laughs> Twist.org slash YouTube. That's the link. And also just go to twist.org. Wait, is that the right link? Yes. Oh, because it's different than the one in the notes. Twist.org? They're the same. YouTube. YouTube.com slash This Week in Science and Twist.org slash YouTube go to the exact same place. Oh, I had no idea. Thank it's you for just... informing me. And thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have a mobile type device, you can simply look for This Week. Uh, the TWIS number four droid app in the Android marketplace or simply this week in science in anything Apple marketplace. -y.
For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. Let's see if I can get this right. <laughs> www.twist.org. That's T-W-I-S dot O-R-G, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Or you can just contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are, at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes through in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, oh, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week, science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, science, science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just not understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy. jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods that are rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye, 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 eye. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you learn anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science This week in science science, science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science. And that does it for our show. That is the end of This Week in Science. We are now into the after show. I don't know how long the after show will go. But we're here for a moment or two. Uh, I hope everyone's had a fun evening.
We had fun. We had fun. Try so hard. Really try. Sometimes it's very hard to make everybody be quiet. <laughs> hey, let's stop jabbering and move on to the next story. This is the this is the way that this is my life. What you doing, Blair? Just here. I'm smiling. here. Just smiling. I'm here. Um, no comment. Right. Um, I was looking at my internet, and it's really fast. I don't understand why I was having so much trouble today. Yeah, you froze for a moment in there. I was freezing a lot. I was like missing entire chunks of your stories. My ping really? is four milliseconds. My download is seventy-two. And my upload is 177. That sounds good. It's very fast. It was like... I don't understand why... It's, I think my old computer's sad. Because you need a cat. I do need a cat. Nice little Stella kitty. The only problem, though, if I got a cat... <clears throat> is that I could no longer take care of other people's cats. Oh, right. And then I wouldn't be Auntie Blair anymore to all oh. of the cats and dogs. The I green eyes on that one. Gorgeous. Yeah. She's a pretty girl. Is she indoor only or is she indoor outdoor? Nope, indoor only. Nice. She wants to be outdoor. Today I was working downstairs in the kitchen and she comes up and she looks at me and then she looks at the door and she reached up and she tapped the door handle to the backyard. Well, not it doesn't go immediately to the backyard. There's like a mud room to the backyard and then there's the back door itself and then there's a screen door. But she, she reached up and she tapped the door handle. Tap, tap, tap. So I opened that for her and she walked into the room and she looked at the back door. So I opened the back door for her and left the screen door shut and locked. And she then, for the next couple of hours, proceeded to sit in the sun and look at the birds and the squirrels in the backyard and lie in the sun. And then when she got too hot, she'd come inside and just collapse on the cold tile. Aww. And then she'd go back out and sit in the sun in, the, in front of the screen. And she'd go collapse on the tile and get cooled down again. It was pretty cute. Cute. Um, a friend okay, of mine has an old okay. bird cage that she puts her cats in in her backyard. And oh, she also funny. has, um, they have these cat tubes. They're just mm -hmm. like long mesh tubes with like a clip on one of the ends. So you can put your cat in the tube out in the backyard. What's that? It's my cat tube. Cat tube. I, guess I would search like for it being... to show it to you, but yeah. my internet can't handle it. <laughs> oh my goodness. I did not check for any mantis. But I, Ed, I didn't leave I didn't let the cat all the way out. There's no actual outside. It's just sitting and looking through the cat through the screen door. Very cute. Yeah, there are Dale Poco, there are those cat subway systems. I've seen there. I was reading this week about the dogs that ride the subway in Moscow. Just they, Moscow stray dogs that ride the subway? Yeah, they know where to get on and off and stuff. It's crazy. I love it. There are birds, pigeons who use the subway mm -hmm. in, the, in, in England. Yeah. Actually, that happens here too. Mm -hmm. And it happened to me recently where I got on a muni and and then the car stopped and it didn't get out went another couple of stops and then it got and then it flew out went right up acted like it knew exactly where it was going uh, they do know they do know they've done it before and they'll do it again yeah matthew litwin in the youtube chat is saying was i able to go to the waterfront blues festival this last week no i missed it i went camping went out to a camp out this weekend so i did miss it which was Unfortunate, but a friend of mine got to play with one of, he's a trumpet player, great musician, and he got to play with a band called Galactic this weekend. So, that, yeah, I can't, I, I got to check out his recording of that. 
but I'm sure a lot of people had a lot of fun. A lot of people. <laughs> Barry in the chat is saying, I was feeding birds in my garden today, then spent all afternoon saving them from my cat. Didn't think it through. No. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe some more thinking that through next time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. My, I think my cat's just fine staring out the screen door. She likes to scratch at the screen door and look at me and say, Meryl, Meryl, like, why do you keep me inside? Mm -hmm. it's like, because you're a cat with very sharp claws and teeth. And she's very agile, so I think she could catch it. She would definitely catch a bird. Mm. I don't want to deal with that. Which cat was that that we just saw? That's Stella. Stella. And what's the other one's name? Cappy. Cappy. Is that short for something? Cappy Star. What does that mean? <laughs> I've told you this story before, haven't I? I forgot. Yeah. So remember we've talked about um, Tabby Star? Uh-huh. The star that first people were like, oh, it's a Dyson sphere. And then, oh, maybe it's surrounded by a bunch of comets. We don't know what the star is. Mm -hmm. And so then we got these cats and we're trying to name them. And I was like, Tabby, Cappy is a Tabby coloration mm -hmm. cat. And I, thought, okay. oh, I thought we could name her Tabby star, like, uh -huh. like, like the star. Yeah. And Kai didn't hear me correctly. And he thought uh... I said Cappy. And so it's Cappy star. Oh, no, I haven't heard that story before. <laughs> That's nope. so cute. <laughs> yeah, he, he misheard me, and now he thinks that she's a cappy. Good. And the other one's Stella. Stella, like a star. I was like, so we were going to have two star-named yeah. cats. Yes. Nice. Yeah. Cappy. Cappy, not tabby, cappy. Cappy star. <laughs> She's a she's a good one too. She's she's our we have two very they're sisters and they're very different personalities. Super fun. There's a report here in Portland recently. I don't know if it's made, it's just here in Portland, but in this southeast neighborhood where I live in the southeast, there was a decapitated a decapitated cat found. And then there was another cat that had been its bowels had been disgorged. And th there was no blood on the scene. So, like, whatever happened to the cats didn't happen where the cats were found. So, there's, like, a whole investigation. Like, the Metropolitan right. Police are trying to figure out what's happening to the cats. Now, there have been sightings of a coyote also. Okay. So, maybe there's coyotes that are getting the cats. But, yeah. I don't know. I don't it's know. the mystery. The mystery of the 4th of July weekend. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. yeah, How are your cats know. with the fireworks, Kiki? They hid in the basement. Yeah. Yeah. They hid in the basement until the fireworks stopped mm -hmm. last night. And I, oh, my goodness. It was pretty neat, though, going through our neighborhood. There's the big Portland displays, but then... Uh, they were it goes the sun goes down so late up here it was just too too late for Kai's bedtime it was just really late mm -hmm. and so um, we were driving through the southeast and it's like every block there was a family or group of families that had set up on the street and everybody had fountains and all sorts of things going and it's very different it's it's it was pretty neat actually. It was very festive all over the place. It was very fun. I thought. I know nice. people do. People and animals do have issues with the loud noises, but mm -hmm. the celebration of this of the day was definitely it was definitely happening. Mm -hmm. It was good. Hey, Fluff, Justin's back. There we go. He's not gone forever. Me? No, I don't. No. Leave what you want, Stella? Oh, bring her up here. <laughs> you want her back again? Yeah. She's rolling on the floor right now, looking really cute. Oh. Love my kitty. Oh. Yes. 
Claire loves the kitty cat. Yeah, I, I do. Know. Now she's going to shoulder perch. Nice. Oh, she's so cute. <laughs> Aww. Ow. She has claws. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> it's good for her. Yeah. She is a good kitty cat. How's your dog, Blair? She's okay. <laughs> Her name's mm. Sunny. Um, she's 15. She's a yellow lab. And uh, every day is an adventure at this point. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I don't know. She She's made another miraculous recovery. But, you know, she's been doing that since she was 11. So, <laughs> I don't know how many more of those she has left in her. We'll see. Hopefully more. Yes, but also I, I recognize she has lived a full, long, good life. She's a 15-year-old lab, which is insane. I mean, yeah, when she was 10, she was under geriatric care. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I recognize she and I both have had a, a very life. long, full, good life together. And so... I am remaining positive about that. Did you see that dog movie that, I don't know who made it, but there's like some dog movie where the dog's supposed to be incarnated a whole bunch of times. I just think that's oh, like just yeah. a just dog out. purpose. I, don't, I think it's just out to make people cry. Yeah. I think somebody was like, what kind of story we can we write that's just going to make people cry? Yeah. yeah. Let's make a dog story. That'll be good. It'll be a dog. No, thank you. And the people will love their dog, and then the dog will die. <laughs> and then it'll, the dog will come back, but it's a different dog. It's a, For another family, and they'll love the dog, the dog, and the dog will die. Let's <laughs> <laughs> like, do Old Yeller just over and over again about every 15 minutes. Yeah, just take movie. Old Yeller to the corn crib four times in one movie. Like Groundhog's Day and Old Yeller in one. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to go see that one. No. No, thanks. Yeah, cut off. She needs some attention. What's going on? You haven't gotten attention enough? Huh? It's because yesterday was scary. Now she's like, yeah. hold me. Yeah. <laughs> it's just waiting to find something to kill. That's all. She's just <sighs> wanting me to remove all of the hair that's coming off of her right now. Yeah. Groom me, human. You know, so much hair. Oh, my gosh. I can't wait for shedding season to be over. <laughs> it's never over. Well, it was kind of, I mean, the winter, it's better. Right now, it's yeah. just like, all her, she, she, I think she's going to be bald. In San Francisco, there there is no shedding season. <laughs> yeah. Because the temperature is constantly changing. Yeah, I someone was invest in large rolls of masking tape. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> just, just, uh, yeah, just put uh, uh, put tape along all the walls. You guys just right. see the cloud Get a of hair that's coming off my cat right now. Yeah, I believe it. Mm. Oh, you just want to snuggle? Oh my goodness. <laughs> She wants Still, to uh, breath. You know, she usually wants to, she gets up and then she jumps down. She's usually not this, not this snuggly. Just testing to see if you're still alive. Is it time to eat the human yet? No, it's still moving. No. No. They're looking for I think I'm getting cat hair in my eyes. Very sheddy. <laughs> Good thing you don't have allergies. No. Not to cats, thank goodness. Yes. You guys have no seriously i wish my camera were better so you could see all this hair i'm gonna put you down because i'm not gonna be able to breathe soon because my, my face is just gonna be a mat of cat hair uh-huh that's what an allergy uh looks like there and you, you can't breathe from the interaction with your cat dander mm -hmm. oh my god identity an identity for you're hilarious <laughs> What kind of story can we write to solve California's drought problem? 
<laughs> Cute pets dying. Ooh. <laughs> Oh my God. Good night, Fada. Thank you for moderating in the YouTubes. Can't hear. Oh my goodness. <sighs> yeah. Is there anything, any emails you guys have gotten that I might have missed because my This Week in Science email is not working? I don't no. get it. That you can think of? No. Thanks for the hair, Stella. I haven't. Okay. Yeah, I thought things were going to be getting fixed, but I'm just more confused than I was before at this Aww. point in time. So. Boo. Oh, what's going on? All right, all right, all right, all right. Boo on that. Yeah. Are you just going to start a new email address at this point? Just scrap it? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think I can start Cause you a could use good identity. You could use the twist.org that, I mean, that's what I'm using right now is a twist.org. No, I mean, I have uh, This Week in Science, and I think we've moved it over. It just has to do with, like, um, DNS server stuff. Like, it has to, the, the internet has to know where to go and where to send things. Mm. And so um, I think there's just a, a step that we're missing somewhere. I think what's going to happen is that I have to create a new Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com email box and that I'm just going to lose all of the emails that were held. Oh, no. mm -hmm. But I, but I've been forwarding it to my, I've been forwarding it to my Gmail for several okay. years. So mm -hmm. I still, backup. I'm not losing backup. everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's still a backup for at least the last mm -hmm. couple of years. So yeah, at a certain point, just freaking cut mm -hmm. bait and it's fine. And if, yeah. I mean, I'm not going back. I mean, Am I going to go back through my email to the very right. first email that I ever had? I could have before now, but now I won't. Right. And it's okay. These things happen. These things happen. It's all right. And I have this very old computer with an old version of Outlook that has my This Week in Science, old This Week in Science emails in oh, it. So wow. I've got multiple things. Yeah. The computer. So I think I might just cut my losses and just make a new Kirsten at this week in science.com email. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Uh, ben Rothig. Yeah. See if I had a higher resolution, maybe I could give you allergies through the internet. Mm. Cat hair for all of you. Yeah. The cat cafes are things I don't quite understand. Like in theory, I get it. But the fact that everyone's just drinking beverages that are just, they all have cat hair in them. <laughs> Let me, I know. It's just, I, I mean, know. even when, when there are, so when service dogs are doing what they're supposed to do and they're curled up under a table, it's fine, right? But when there are service dogs that are, that are not good at remaining under a table and it's in a restaurant, I'm always kind of like, how hygienic is this? And how likely is it that that's actually a service dog? Right. Because usually if they're, mm -hmm. if they're properly trained, they do that. They go like curl up under the table. You don't even really know they're there. But yeah, it's the ones that are allowed into restaurants that are, that are constantly kind of like moving around and like scratching. And, and there's airborne stuff getting in my food. I'm like, it's less <laughs> than ideal. So Yum. Cat Cafe. Uh is well, this a cat cafe is... where the owner has a cat and it allows it to run around the cafe? No, or not, I don't think it's really a cafe. Isn't it just a place where you go and pet cats? Well, some of them do serve food and drink. Oh. But the, but usually they're, they're adoptable cats, which is what makes it kind of cool. So quite often it will be hosted by a shelter. And so most of the cats there are adoptable. So you go, you order lunch. They bring with, with your lunch. They bring a adoptable cat to your table. No, the you cats are just wandering around. around. Oh gosh! Oh no! So the whole place reeks of cat litter, or worse? I don't know. I've never been to one. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with identity for toxoplasma. Uh, cat fur for lunch hmm. <laughs> yeah 
Toxo lunchy cat fur. Mm, yummy. Um, Eric Knapp, I did get your uh, what has science done for me lately story. And I'm you actually just made me think I'm going to schedule. And what I'm trying to do is get these lined up in advance. And so um, I will be reading yours in, oops, nope, that's not what I wanted to do. In two weeks, we'll be reading yours. But I did get it, so... I'm sorry I didn't email you back immediately. Thank you very much for your story. So these are, they're piling up now, they're stacking. I'm trying to get that to happen. Yes, I think I've got, we've got, you know, it's not a huge stack. I've got a little stack of like three or four. So as long as I keep getting people to write in, we will always have a constant flow of these stories, which I think is, nice. I think it's great. Yeah, it's very nice. Oh, so interesting. I'm looking into this cat cafe situation. And I guess in other countries, they do serve food and drink where the cats are. But in the United States, governmental food service regulations um, require that the area where the cats are playing or being considered for adoption must be separate from the area where food and drink are served. Oh, thank yeah, goodness. That's what I thought, yeah. And so the ones in the United States are unusual in their focus on adoptions. The ones in other countries are often just a place where there's cats. I went to one in Amsterdam that was on a boat in a canal. And that was pretty awesome. And they were cats that were potentially up for adoption. So it was a bunch of cats on a little boat in a canal. You could go pet them and then take one home if you wanted to. I mean, I was traveling, so obviously I didn't. But anyway, it was pretty awesome. That was years ago. <laughs> In December 2015, cafes. Seattle, Washington opened its first cat cafe called Seattle Meowtropolitan. Uh-huh. No. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, in September 2016, Eat Per Love Cat Cafe opened in Columbus, Ohio. I found a recipe for how to cook cat. Gross. Yeah. Yeah. Ew. I found, that, I found that once in a cookbook. It was like a British cookbook. Uh, this is funny. The Wikipedia article for Cat Cafe. See also petting zoo. <laughs> petting zoo. That's cat, not cat petting really. Zoo. Oh, no. Charleston, South Carolina opened a pounce cat cafe and wine bar. I like that. Yeah. I like cats. And I mean, we've got Justin around all the time when we have cat talk. So, I mean, that's like our wine bar. Oh, I get it. <laughs> Hominin. Crumbs and whiskers. In Washington, D.C. Whining about the cats again. <coughs> and the toxoplasma. So there are, uh, according to this recipe, there are more than, there is apparently more than one way to prepare cat, uh, even more than Seriously? one way to skin it in the beginning. Oh dear. But once you've skinned it, you are ready to cook. Says uh, here, uh, one recommends placing a cat nope. in a very high-powered. No. Nope. Mac. No. Nope. Nope. Can we stop? No. Why? Kit it's T a, was the first cat just... cafe to announce its plans to open in the United States. The news was first leaked via an article posted via The Laughing Squid and SFist in 2014. Although Kit T was unable to open as the first cat cafe due to raised rents and construction delays, they are proudly known as the very first and only cat cafe in San Francisco, California. On 24th June 2015, Kit T finally opened its doors to the anticipating public and continues to support cats from Wonder Cat Rescue and the ACC in San Francisco. Why do cats why do cats chew on cardboard? Uh uh cuz it's absorbent? I don't know. Both of my cats, they love cardboard boxes. <sighs> Just grab them and rip chunks out of the cardboard. They claw the cardboard. And rip it's like are like these these are the cats trees in the house which is fine i can clean up the cardboard it's not my furniture 
<laughs> I find it very strange, though. The Bag of Nails in Bristol is a cat pub. Bag of Nails. <laughs> and has as many as 24 cats. Lady Dinah's Cat Emporium. Oh, my god! Found in Newcastle. Cat cafes. Oh, my goodness. I just like the Okinawans, name. Okinawans, like right. Okinawans used to eat a cat soup. Oh, boy. Maya no Ushuri. Ushuri. <laughs> Barry in the YouTube chat room says, Cat Pacino, two sugars, hold the fur. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Le Café de Chat. Yeah. Oui, oui, oui. Is it in Paris? Meow, meow, meow. Meow, meow. Le meow. Le meow. Le meow. <sighs> yep. All right, you guys. I am going to head toward bed. Yeah, it's time for bed. It's that time of day. and I'm going to dream of kitties. No. <laughs> Cat soup seems to very, be a very popular way to eat a cat. Identity 4 says it's a very, very strange anime film. The world's first cat cafe, Cat Garden, opened in... Guesses? What, what? year? What year and what location? World's know. first cat cafe. I would say Taiwan. They seem to list... At the highest. That uh, that you've got. How about eighteen twenty? Okay, Justin. Uh, wait. Oh gosh, I have no idea. Mm, I think it has to be sometime in the. Uh, when did things get really weird? <laughs> Let me say the eighties. <laughs> that is an odd question. The eighties. The world's oh. the world's first cat cafe, Cat Garden, opened its doors in. Taipei, Taiwan, in right. nine. Oh, they were eating in nineteen ninety eight. No, they weren't eating. They were cats. eating cat. I was they right. Weren't. I picked Taiwan, though. I got the country right. They eat you more cats than anybody. The, you according to the study, right. oh this my website, goodness. not study. Uh, Hawaii, I guess, uh, has a little history of cat eating too. Panoramic is wondering. She doesn't know what the fuss is about cats. <laughs> It's because it's, I think it's, if you don't own the cat, the cat is not tied to you. But if you're like, like cats, when they know somebody, it, and it takes longer to get to know a cat than it does to get to know a dog. Once you do, you've got, there's, it's, there's a relationship there. Mm -hmm. kind of relationship. It's, a, it's a relationship that you have to work harder for, definitely. Um, you don't have to it. train it. <laughs> yes. Um, it's lower maintenance. You don't have to take it for a walk. Um, you can leave for a couple days. The cat is fine. I think that's the that's the pleasure of the cat. But but what is the impact of the cat on the environment into which you've introduced? Well, it? if it's if an it's indoors just, cat, nothing. Like We're not cats, talking about indoors absolute, cats. There's no I'm, very few cats are literally Justin. indoor cats. That's not Justin. true. They're indoor true. outdoor cats. Almost almost all the time. Uh-uh. Mm. Uh -uh. I have indoor cats and so I you, to, you keep them that. captive indoors, this wild animal. You keep it indoors all the time. I do. Justin, never, you keep your children captive indoors? The, no, I don't. I sometimes have to force them to go outside. Uh, uh, we did, uh, you force your children into the elements? Yeah, well, I said we went to the raptor center again today. We have you nice mix little... your children with predators? Yes. I love it when the cats purr and they get to purr. And, and I always wonder, like, what happens when a cat stumbles upon the, the raptor center? <laughs> the, she might get eaten by the raptors? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, this is like, you know, the cat's like, ooh, there's a big lunch. I want to reach in and get at this. I don't think nah, a cat would think cats like that. Know. No. Cats know what a predator is. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. For sure. All the right. large talons, they're aware. Yeah. We'll see what Justin but, says when his 
kids drag home that first <gasps> dead bird as a gift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe you need to put those jangly, bright colored collars on your children. <laughs> Just scare I'm, away I'm, the I'm, bird. Uh, oh dear. I'm going to have a great question though, to ask uh, somebody at the Raptor Center next time. You should. Have you ever, cats ever gotten in here before? I doubt it. All right, you guys. I'm tired. Yeah, let's this go to bed. I'm going to go to bed. I hope Good everyone night, comes back to join us next week. Good night, Blair. Good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. Good night. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Thanks for yeah, a great show. Yeah. Have a good one, all. And there's many holidays coming up, special holidays. Check your twist calendar to be sure of what days are coming up. We got some good ones on the list this month. We'll see you later.